really proud to be here. I had a lot of fun. You guys having fun? I'm here to change that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, don't throw any of those paper airplanes at me. So I founded a company called Pensa. We're in Brooklyn. We're a design development firm. We do a lot of different things, anything from stuff for Panasonic, Pepsi, Playtex, a lot of big companies. If you have a P in your name, we'll work with you. Like we work with Pfizer. They got to add, add the P to work for us. Um, so we live solidly in the intellectual property world, which is why I'm here. I wanted to give you my point of view. If we like fart, our clients are there to patent that just, just in case it was a good idea there somewhere. Uh, and we have very fundamental different viewpoints on patents. So the open source community really feels that the patents are there to hold good ideas hostage. Whereas the patent world really believes that if the patents are there to ensure some sort of return on the investment of the amount of time that you invested in developing that innovation. And open source community views themselves as being there for the greater good, as the patent community just sees that as working really hard and giving away all your hard work for free. And when we talk about licenses, you know, when I talk to people in the open source community about licenses and they say, you know, they're viral, like good, like kitten videos are viral in a good way. And when I talk to my clients, they think viral, like really, really bad. So like one of our clients, probably should have mentioned their name, but it rhymes with like Rotomola. <laughs> <laughs> We had to negotiate like over three months on letting them use, letting us use an Arduino in our prototypes, even though in the end the, the final uh, product had nothing to look like the Arduino. It was just a prototype, just a blinky model, and they like, the lawyers are up in arms. They're like, viral. And so we have very different point of views of each other, you know, and neither of them are <laughs> entirely true, but so. This led us to think about, like, when we did the DIYers, which I won't get into what it does, but essentially, if you think of the 3D printers, are really good at printing volumes, and laser cutters are good at lines, and I mean, uh, planes. We wanted to make something that could print lines, and we're gonna demo it later. We thought, like, maybe we should open source it. And let me tell you why. So when you think of, like, the design and development process that we do, it's like, you know, you come up with a good idea, then you design it, engineer it, and put it out in the marketplace, and hope to hell that somebody's gonna buy your idea. But there's, a, there's a really not exactly that. You, know, you gotta really think about where great ideas come from. So we go out, we watch people, we watch them use their product, we get a really good sense of what their emotional and functional needs are, and then we analyze that and we get some insights from that, and then we sort of model, test, prototype stuff, and then we sometimes go back out to consumers and talk to them about it, and that sort of makes a better development model. So when you go from idea to market, if you really want to make sure somebody's going to buy it, you got to work with your consumers so you have this sort of improved development model where you're observing all the way to testing, modeling, and doing that over and over again. But the thing is that there's still this kind of barrier between the company and the consumer because you really got to hope somebody's going to buy it, and by the time you develop it, it's sort of this slow and expensive and risky. So we see a lot of like new development models where they're trying to really drive the consumer in there so the consumer is like designing an, uh, the product themselves. So like there's a ton of great examples of that. There's like quirky and crowdsourcing, uh, you know, participatory design. There's a lot of it where you're basically getting the people to design their own things and then you're going to sell it to them. Or, you know, you could design a blank canvas uh, like, you know, Converse sneakers have them and, uh, or a lot of phones where you can personalize it or use it for mass customization. Or there's a lot of people who use Kickstarter not only for the crowdfunding, but just to test it to see if people really want it before you invest in it. Or you, if people find stuff that they don't like out there, they're just gonna make their own and they're gonna use Shapeways, Pinoco, uh, or just remix an existing product and be something else. So we see all these different models out there that are very different from the traditional model where a company makes something, has an idea, creates a product, ships it out to the consumer, where now like the consumers and the companies are working together on creating a product that the consumer really wants, right? So you get this sort of instant feedback loop, it's community driven, it's built together, and it leads to less risk and more success. So when we were thinking about it, and we did, and we did the DIYer, we're like, wait a minute, couldn't we use open sourcing as a way to get this feedback loop and get a lot of great information and a lot of people giving us good and positive 
feedback and a lot of negative feedback and features that they want. Plus, you get all these other nice benefits. You get free customer services because you got the community out there giving you uh, helping each other. You get a lot of free advertising from the blogs. You get early adoption for people who don't really know how to use your technology because the community is out there to help each other. And the less lawyer fees. It's not free, it's actually kind of expensive to open source something if you really think about it, but it's less than if you were to patent something. So that's nice, but there's still those legitimate business concerns, right? You're gonna get clones out there, or as in the intellectual property world, that's like a knockoff. Somebody's gonna knock off your product, and they're gonna offer it for a lower price, or they're gonna just tweak it and give it a slightly better performance, or they're just gonna speed to market much faster than you are. So we were like, well, this is a legitimate concern. This, isn't this an issue? But then we thought about it, and it was like, wait, we're in the intellectual property world. We have these issues every day. These aren't open source issues. These are business problems. We do a lot of work for Oxo. Just about everything we do gets knocked off and is offered a lower price or a slightly tweak to be like slightly better, or they just beat us to the market. So you hear all these concerns about open source, but they're not open source problems. These are business problems. If there's money to be made, somebody will be there. <laughs> <laughs> so, the other thing is patents are not the law. There are a lot of people think, well, patents are, I'm done, I'm patented, it's the law. But it's not, it's just a place in line saying that you were there first. And then, in the end, you're going to have to sue to defend yourself on that patent. So it's only as good or as strong as the financial backing. And a lot of times, even if it's in the slam dunk case, you can lose. I've had friends who lost hundreds of thousands of dollars on slam dunk forgeries. But still, wrong time. And the other thing is, really, from our world, the defense doesn't win in the marketplace. A great brand wins them in the marketplace. And great brands are built on loyal fans who really, truly love your product. And the loyal fans that are diehard really believe that you share the same values as a company as the fan does. So people who buy Nike or Apple or any of these things are totally really love those products, really believe that the people who work there are just like that. And if you start diverging from those values, then you're gonna see your fans flee. And that's a big problem. So we saw, well look, the open source community is full of really loyal fans. And there's a lot of great brands out there because they feel that they share the same values as their fans. So I thought, Recently, this was a really great example. So Tangibot had the exact same product as the MakerBot. So from the open source community point of view, clone, it's fine. That's what you're allowed to do. But it was something about the value, something about the spin, that it just didn't feel that it was for the greater good. So if you really look at it, they didn't evoke the real values of the open source community. So they lost, they got a tenth of what they were asking for. Like they really lost. So there's, I, I know like there's been a lot of talk about the replicator too, right? So I'm not going to comment on both sides, but I'll tell you one thing. The grass isn't much greener on my side of the fence. And the other thing is, when you read all the blogs, nobody's talking about, gee, I really wanted to sit up all night and read that open source code. Everybody's talking about values, about the brand and the values. So I guess the question is, having done it once, will we ever do it again? I mean, the answer is like definitely yes. But through this experience, we're definitely going to have an eye on the brand, the community that it serves, and the business model. Thanks.